Okay, so welcome everybody to our chat. Um, I'm Janelle Zacias, and I have today on the call, hey Nisia, um, I have today on the call Dr. Kira Lewis, and it's all about hormones today because my background with Thin Living has been hormonal based. I've had imbalances for a number of years, and through my changing of the chemical toxins in my home, I noticed that my love was for hormone tox. And so I want to provide you guys today with Kira, who really kind of specializes in hormones herself and does a lot of women in her clinic. So again, I'm Janelle from the Shoe Swap. I now live in Burnaby and pumped to introduce you to Kira. So go ahead, Kira. Hey guys, um, thanks for having me, Janelle. So I am a naturopathic physician. I practice in Northern BC. So I'm actually located in Prince George. Um, my practice is physical, but then I also offer uh, virtual consultations via um, kind of like web telemedicine. And so like Janelle spoke to, I have a focus in women's health. I work very closely with hormonal concerns from periods, all the way through the lifespan up until menopause. So kind of the whole range of a woman's life's hormonal lifespan. I work in that realm and I'm super happy to be here and educate. That's one of my passions is just spreading the knowledge and education around the inner workings of our body, specifically hormones. I think it's super empowering. So I'm really excited to be here today and answer some questions. We do. I yeah. first mentioned that we met through UBCO in Kelowna so I forgot to mention that yeah and um, we've kind of stayed connected just through mountain biking and just through social media over the last few years so share a lot of common interest which is awesome so the first question from people in my group have been asking in regards to mood stress levels anxiety and sleep deprivation is why there are so many fluctuations throughout the month with these and can you explain our hormones and menstrual cycle Okay, so this is a big, <laughs> big topic. Uh, lots to unpack in that one question. Um, but we'll start with, I guess, basic menstrual cycle. There's three phases of the cycle. There's the menstrual phase when you're bleeding. Then there's the follicular, which is the first half of the cycle up until ovulation happens. And then there's the luteal, which is post-ovulation, or kind of the second half of the month. Um, and then so in those phases, you sort of have these leading hormones. So in that follicular phase, so post-menses leading up to ovulation, we have estrogen as the dominant hormone. Post-ovulation is when your body starts to produce progesterone, and then that's going to be the dominant hormone or kind of the active hormone at that time. Plus there's still estrogen in the background, but we'll kind of keep it simple with the two leading phases. Um, and then so depending on what phase of your cycle in is, is going to dictate levels of hormones, which then is going to impact um, mood, stress, anxiety, kind of everything how we feel can really be stripped back to our biochemistry and what our hormones are up to at that time. Um, and then layering on top of that, we have another hormone called cortisol. So cortisol is our main stress hormone. We have epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is the fight or flight, like that acute stress, but low grade day-to-day -day stress is going to be thanks to cortisol is the big one that runs that. Um, and then, so if cortisol is running a little too high, I mean, we're really busy, we're doing X, Y, and Z, taking too much on, that's going to allow too much cortisol to be pumped out. And then that can through different feedback loops with respect to your hormones, feedback and actually suppress your secretion of estrogen and progesterone, which can then throw off the menstrual cycle. Um, and if that becomes out of rhythm, then that can affect mood, it can affect so causing more anxiety, irritability, lower mood. Um, and then it's cortisol is gonna be more at the root of it when we start to see sleep becoming affected and then also if we're bound by other constraints that are then affecting sleep whether it's shift work or just our schedules are starting to impact our sleep then our body doesn't have that chance to rest and repair and restore overnight and that's crucial for all of our hormone fluctuations especially cortisol allows to or 
we need good sleep to then replenish our cortisol overnight for the next day. And if that's not happening, we're um, starting our day with less. And then that circles back to then throwing off our estrogen progesterone. So it's kind of this vicious downward spiraling cycle. Um, and then I guess coming back to different parts of the cycle and how that also affects our sleep, um, we need progesterone. So in that second half of the cycle, progesterone helps promote calm relaxation that actually works on GABA receptors in the brain. Um, and if we do have any hormonal imbalances in our body, say we're stressed and our cortisol is high, we're actually not going to be producing as much progesterone as we might need at that time, which then ultimately will affect sleep and increase anxiety. Um, so it is so crucial. As you can see, everything is so interconnected that it is so important to have good night's sleep, really respect your sleep, have a good sleep routine, good sleep hygiene. Um, it's so fundamental for all of our hormonal rhythms, whether it's cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, and then melatonin ties into that as well. Um, yeah. Was there more to that question? I'm trying to think. I got off on a um, tangent. <laughs> that question was just, um, yeah, I guess like why there are so many fluctuations. It's just, I guess, the time of the month and things coming. Mm -hmm. out. Like you mentioned stress and how it affects our levels and it takes, you know, our cortisol, then it takes our progesterone. Um, yeah. That pretty much nailed it, I think, for that question for sure. What about mm -hmm. the, the mood part of it? Because I do know like personally, uh, well, a lot of women that I talk to, it's yeah. the, the, the PMS, like the, the irritability, the, the moodiness. And so what is actually, what's causing that state of mind? Um, and mm -hmm. how like maybe could we, I guess, eventually with the nutrition topic about after that, how you can actually help that part of the, the month, but what, what's causing that? Yeah. So the moodiness are kind of that classic, like PMS time frame, And for some women, it's kind of that week leading up to your period is when things, um, get to their peak or when they're at their worst, I suppose, that week prior to when you have your period is when both your progesterone and your estrogen are at their highest level. So your body is being influenced by the most amount of hormone it's going to that entire month. And then so it's how you respond to it. We shouldn't typically have big mood fluctuations. Like inevitably you have hormones, it's going to influence your mood, but when it becomes problematic and when it's something that I actually want to work on with patients is when it becomes so extreme. And when those transitions are like, you're over here and then like a minute later, you're all the way over here with respect to mood, that comes down to hormonal imbalances and imbalances meaning the ratio of how much estrogen you have versus how much progesterone you have. They balance each other out nicely. Typically we see nowadays more estrogen in relation to progesterone and that can be from a host of different reasons and we can get into that a little bit more with nutrition, but a lot of it has to do with environmental exposure and um, artificial or kind of synthetic estrogens that are found in our food, our beauty products, what we're putting on our body, just in our environment, in our water. And that kind of increases our toxic burden and actually builds up more estrogen in our system, which then leads to these imbalances. And then so typically with the higher estrogen in relation to lower progesterone, estrogen with respect as our hormone is more of our like it's our motivating hormone, it's our sex drive, it's our get up and go hormone. That being said, too much of it tips us over into that irritability and that anxiety and kind of that kind of that wired feeling that's going to be estrogen. And so if those are like moods and symptoms you are experiencing, that's telling me that hey, you know what? We need to calm the estrogen down as well as sometimes supporting the progesterone and bringing that up and then that's also tying in okay what's going on stress wise as well so right that makes mm -hmm. sense i mean when i talk in my classes for like, living's all about cleaning products and chemical mm -hmm. products and how endocrine disruptors can affect those hormones too as well right so mm -hmm. uh, that's a big topic in our classes a lot so yeah next question for you which is nutrition based this is actually mm -hmm. one of my questions as well mm -hmm. how do you play a role in hormones and what foods do you recommend eating in like the 
luteal phase versus follicular phase, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, got it. Yeah, so I guess just blanket across the entire menstrual cycle to build healthy levels of hormones and to be able to make hormones and have your body function, we need to be consuming healthy fats. So these, the estrogen and progesterone, these hormones I'm talking about mostly today, they're called steroid sex hormones. The backbone of how our body makes these is actually from cholesterol. So sometimes I think cholesterol has this like negative vibe around it, like it's bad. Um, but we do need to be consuming these healthy fats for our body to be able to synthesize and make these hormones. So healthy fats in the diet all cycle long are going to be essential for hormone health. And so that's um, cooking with good oils, nuts and seeds. I love snacking on those like avocados, olives, incorporating those into your diet when you can. And then, um, differences in the phases of the cycle. So the follicular phase of the cycle being that first half and then ovulation and then the luteal phase. So more specifically in the luteal phase, so that second half of the cycle after you've ovulated, progesterone is gonna be that leading hormone. Progesterone actually increases our basal body temperature, our core temperature, it rises because it turns us essentially into an incubator if pregnancy is going to happen or not, that's going to be progesterone. And by raising our body temperature, just from this one hormone ripping through our system, it can increase our calorie demands by between 300 to 500 extra calories per day that we need to be consuming in that second half of the cycle. And a lot of the time we fill that void with those cravings for those, um, those like chocolate, those sweets, those chips, those kind of like those quick fixes to get that sugar because our body is telling us, hey, we're deficient on calories today. We need like a quick fix to get those calories up. Um, so that being said, to compensate for that extra calorie demand in the second half of your cycle, I recommend nutrient dense foods. So nutrient dense being you're focusing on getting your vitamins, your minerals, your healthy fats, healthy proteins, so again, focusing on good vegetables, you're getting nuts and seeds, you're getting your avocados, and that's where you're making up for that calorie deficit um, versus going for those quick carbohydrates would be a big difference. Um, and then throughout the cycle, as well as focusing on healthy fats to synthesize the hormones, we also need to be focusing on the quality of foods we're eating, organic when you can is going to be best. We're um, steering clear of those pesticides, which can become endocrine disruptors, which then can contribute to hormonal imbalances down the road. Like I spoke to earlier, can lead to PMS symptoms and whatnot. And it's just cleaner overall for other aspects of health too, not just hormonal health. Um, and then as well as just overall health too, we wanna be focusing on just whole real foods. So things that are grown from the ground, minimal processing, things you're cooking yourself. Right. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. for that, the nutrition part of it, um, for menopausal women, is it the same in regards to the calorie consumption um, or is it different and is it the same, like, is it less or how does that work for women who are men's, um, in their menopausal phase? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're going through kind of that perimenopause, which is when your cycles are starting to change and then menopause officially when your periods are done, you essentially, that transition is when you stop ovulating. That's kind of what marks that transition. So you don't have that extra progesterone increasing the calorie demands of your body. So you don't necessarily need to be making up for that calorie deficit anymore. That being said, in that menopausal transition, estrogen is still quite high and you're not ovulating to balance it out with progesterone anymore. So you're left with however many years, some women it's one, some women it's 10 um, of your estrogen being up here and then it's slowly dwindling its way down. So we really need to focus on healthy, clean eating as far as minimal additives, minimal pesticides, any of those endocrine disruptors are only going to worsen that higher estrogen state and that can exacerbate 
menopausal symptoms such as like the mood change, changes in metabolism as far as weight gain, hot flashes and night sweats is a big one with estrogen being up there. So emphasis in that time or realm of hormones would be um, just emphasis on clean eating. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes sense. Um, What's the next question? Because there's a lot of women who want to watch this afterwards and they are more Mm -hmm. menopausal. So um, Mm -hmm. next question is breastfeeding and hormones. Mm -hmm. Um, That's all the question was. She didn't really emphasize what she wanted. Yeah. But just breastfeeding and hormones in general. And since Mm -hmm. you are like a pretty new mom, um, Mm -hmm. how's it been for you for the whole regulation of that and that whole topic for yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of just a big, like, I guess, big topic, but we'll uh, stick to. So when you, or after you give birth, your hormones completely drop off as soon as the placenta is out of your body. And then your body releases oxytocin, which is part of labor and delivery, um, uterine contractions and everything to get the baby there. But also with the oxytocin there, that's involved in breast milk production. And then there's another hormone called prolactin, which then also helps your body produce milk. So prolactin and oxytocin are going to be the two main hormones involved in breastfeeding at that time. And so this is really neat how the body works as far as when you're producing prolactin at high concentration. So when you're breastfeeding a newborn baby kind of all day, every day for the foreseeable future, prolactin will actually feed back to your brain and shut down the rest of your hormonal cascades that cause you to produce estrogen and progesterone. So that's kind of why like if you're breastfeeding, your period doesn't come back for several months, um, as well as likely you're not, or you're not ovulating. And then, so you can't necessarily get pregnant right away after you've just had a baby. So it's sort of your body's protective mechanism. So when prolactin is being produced, you're shutting down these hormones. So essentially you could be going three months to a year and a half postpartum. It totally is individual when menstruation returns postpartum, but a big part of that is prolactin, prolactin shutting that system down. So when that system is shut down, you don't have estrogen and you don't have progesterone in your system. So you're almost working with this new realm of imbalances in a sense where pre-pregnancy you had these hormones and now you don't. So you're sort of navigating this new normal of kind of life without hormones. And there's a lot of research on how low hormones or no hormones in this time influences mental health, physical health. So as far as looped into influencing postpartum depression, lack of hormones has a role to play there. Physical health, metabolism, just overall body composition, just because you don't have your estrogen progesterone there. So then eventually, like however long it takes for your body, and again, this is very individual. On average, it's around six to eight months postpartum that menstruation does start to return again. Um, So when you do start menstruating again and start getting a monthly cycle, okay, then we're working with estrogen and progesterone are starting to ramp back up. You're starting to get exposed to those again. Hopefully your cycles have returned to normal as they were pre-pregnancy. That's, excuse me, that's not always the case. Cycles might be a little wonky those first few months. And if things aren't, if your cycle's not regular, that is kind of your number one indicator that there is a hormonal imbalance and then that should pique your interest to um, get things looked at and start to do things to support your body to balance those. That makes sense. We have a question from somebody. Is that Mm -hmm. why women have postpartum depression, low hormones? Yeah, it can be a reason for it, like as a, or a contributing factor. It's not the case for everyone. It's going to be so individual, but I mean, the research is on as women, how much estrogen and progesterone influence our mental health, our mental development. Um, And then if you think like you go from pregnancy where that's the highest possible level of hormone exposure you're going to experience in your life, to then in five days you go from that to none, it's a lot for your body to adjust to. And some women are impacted by that more than others. 
So that can definitely be a contributing factor. It's not the only one though. We also need to consider other neurotransmitters, environment, nutrition, like it all, it all is going to tie together there. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, which is not my question, but it's, I want to actually ask it myself mm -hmm. too, is to do with birth control. So mm -hmm. um, the question is repercussions of birth control over 10 plus years. So I, I've been on birth control for many of years. I went off of it about five years ago, the IUD, because I was, I could never find one that balanced for myself. And then I had cystic acne, then I had imbalances. So I was like, I'm getting off this. I'm going to go all natural. And so what are the repercussions of birth control over 10 plus years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. That's something that I talk about almost every day with different yeah, patients. Yeah, I um, about the mucous membrane and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, this one's tricky because there is like so many women are on them for ten plus years, and it's it's working for them. It's serving its purpose. They're not getting pregnant. That's that's great, um, but. We need to think of, and I feel like, I don't know, like sometimes our hormones, our estrogen and progesterone get funneled into like, well, it's just for reproduction. So I don't want to have a baby right now. I don't need them. And true, they are important for reproduction. But as women, like biologically, we need those hormones. They influence, like I just spoke to our mental health, our mood. There's... Um, a really big role to play for estrogen and progesterone with respect to our bone health. Um, there's a researcher based out of Vancouver and, or she's a doctor and a researcher, but she spent like her entire career is working on um, researching osteoporosis. And some of the studies she's done evaluates bone mineral density of women who have been on the birth control versus not. And it can increase your risk for having osteoporosis and less dense bone mineral because you don't have those hormones in those crucial years. Like you think of typically the age women are on birth control from ages 14 to 25, like that's when you're building your peak bone mass and you don't have your hormones on your side to do that. Um, birth control pill is, as well as suppressing your own hormones it will affect libido and sexual health as far as um, the vaginal mucosa, as well as the microflora. So the little bacteria that we have to have there, that will change the composition. Um, there is debate on whether or not it affects fertility. The research says it does not in itself directly for affect fertility, um, is the concluded statement. Um, that the drug companies have put out and uh, fertility specialists. That being said, I do see a lot of women come to me and they've been off the pill for a year or two and they're trying to conceive and having difficulty. And it's like, oh, well, how long were you on the pill for? It's like, oh, well, I was on it from age 15 and now I'm 25 and I want to have kids sort of thing. Um, you don't necessarily, because the birth control pill is, kind of doing its thing for you, suppressing your hormones, and then it's kind of allowing you to cycle, but it's running the show, you don't get a clear picture as to what your own hormones are capable of. So not necessarily, like it doesn't affect fertility, but it would mask if you already had an underlying predisposition to have fertility concerns, if that makes sense. Um, like a big one that comes to mind is a lot of young women with PCOS get with regular cycles, like their periods show up, who knows when, like once every three months and their doctor is like, oh, we'll go on the birth control pill. And it's like, great. Okay. Now they get a predicted monthly cycle, but then however many years down the road, 10 years down the road, they come off the pill, try to conceive, but lo and behold, they have, they've had PCOS this whole time. And they didn't know, and they weren't necessarily doing anything to directly address that. So then they're kind of playing catch up in that sense. Um, and then also with respect to going on birth control pills at a younger age and then being on it for so long, you don't, you don't know what your true cycle is like because the pill is in there, it's doing its thing, it's running the show, but your hormones never really get a chance to 
find their nice rhythm and figure out kind of how they work and how your cycle is, whether you have a 27 day cycle or a 34 day cycle, like they never learn your body never gets into that rhythm. And then, so when you're in your late twenties or thirties or whenever it is, you're coming off the pill, your body kind of has to play catch up and relearn how to do that. And that can look different for everyone else. Um, yeah. So I think the biggest thing is just, um, like you're depriving your body of your own hormones. Um, and they have just so much more activity than just with respect to reproduction that a it's uh we need to honor that and let them do their thing with other systems as well right makes sense mm-hmm. so this next question I didn't, I didn't ask you before but i just came mm-hmm. to mind this is mostly for women because it's just through and living yeah. but um men topic for you just one quick mm-hmm. right i i find that hormones is like oh women and yeah <laughs> like, they all have you know partners maybe husbands and it's nice to know how we can support our husbands um mm-hmm. kind of stuff and so what effects do maybe these synthetics or whatever is in our environment have on men in regards to testosterone or whatever they have um and how can we like what are the symptoms we can see like if, if it's like sex drive goes down when they're older how, what does it look like um for for in, in that whole conversation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It totally affects men. And I think it's, that's great that we, you brought that up um, and brought it to our attention. Um, Yeah. As far as they are exposed to the same environmental toxins as we are more so than not they're um, like they mimic estrogen is the um, how they interfere. And in women, unfortunately we're more sensitive. So you see it more affect women that being said, men with a higher estrogen content than they should have, um, it will start to affect their body composition can be a big one. So testosterone, that's why men are typically more muscly and lean. They have testosterone, they can lose weight easier. Um, that being said, if their estrogen starts to creep up, then their body composition starts to change. Um, they start to gain weight their mood can be significantly affected if estrogen is too high. Um, And then definitely it can creep in and start to affect libido um, and sexual function. And then I think I touched on mood as well. Yeah, mood is a big one for them. Um, And then we can also see too, and it's kind of this vicious cycle um, in males and females, but, in men if body composition starts to change and there's more adipose so more fat tissue our fat tissue is really good at storing hormones and toxins but then our fat tissue also has an aromatase enzyme that can change testosterone into estrogen so then that can become even more so problematic in men that become slightly overweight whether it's due to hormonal imbalances, lifestyle, what have you. But if they do put on more adipose tissue, that's actually very detrimental to their testosterone, which then increases their estrogen, which then causes them to gain more weight, which then makes it even harder to kind of get back to where they were. So men definitely do, they do have significant hormonal imbalances that can happen to them as well. Right. Um, cause you touched on the nutritional factor for women and supporting our progesterone, progesterone levels. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, for, for men though, can, can you help compensate for that? Um, so it's actually an, an increase of estrogen is what's happening for men. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not, is it taking, well, their testosterone is going down, but how, is there any kind of compensation for that? Or is there anything that can be, is it like more like lifting weights and more muscle mass? How? Mm-hmm what's what's that difference between women and men for nutritional wise yeah so they don't have i guess it would be like that cyclical variation in calories um same as women for men though that testosterone is also a cholesterol based hormone so by consuming healthy fats that's how your body synthesizes it um and then definitely and I mean, I recommend this for females as well as males, but any weight training or resistance exercises where you're stressing the muscle tissue 
is promoting a healthy metabolism. And then especially for men too, that in itself can promote testosterone release. And that's keeping that level nice and robust. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, one question, is there a natural source of progesterone? I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's, um, I, this is kind of tricky to answer, but I guess I'll say no. There are some natural things you can do to support your own production of progesterone. So whether that's herbs, I think um, there is actually the one oil. What's that one yeah, called? Progesterone Yeah. That is yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I mean, and that would be herbal based that supports your body's own production of it. Um, can I give you something that would replace your own progesterone? There's no natural thing. Like there's lots of, um, I think there's misinformation out there on like wild yam. And if you eat that, it gives you progesterone. Potentially it's a precursor. Your body still has to convert it and turn it into progesterone. There's no guarantee that that's what your body's going to do with it. Essentially. Um, there is, so that's kind of yeah. one answer. And then the other answer is there is um, bioidentical hormone prescriptions that you can get. And that is, so I can prescribe you progesterone and that would be the exact chemical compound of progesterone that you would make, but it would come in a prescription form. So sometimes that's called like a natural progesterone prescription because it is exactly the same as what your body should be making versus there's um the progesterone that's found in the iud or the birth control pill that's called a progestin and that is a synthetic progesterone it is um similar to progesterone it acts similar in the body but its chemical structure is different than progesterone versus you can get a prescription for progesterone and that is progesterone if that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's it for the questions from the pre-questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to first pause this and then we can do open for questions in a second. But sure. how do people reach out to you though? Like through email, what's your Instagram? Like what's the best way to contact you if they want to touch base? Yeah. So uh, definitely my Instagram would be the best uh, place to go for information. So it's at Dr. Kira Lewis. I guess you can see my name on the Zoom yeah. there. So it's just Dr. Kira Lewis. Um, and then on my Instagram, I'm usually posting just a bunch of information. I really like to spread the knowledge on hormone health. And then on my Instagram, there's a link to get to my website. And then from there, there's even more information. And then that would have um, direct booking information too, if you wanted to, if you felt you needed a virtual consultation or anything like that. Perfect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to cancel this video in a second. Thanks again for chatting. I'm going to end this now mm. and take some questions.